but to be wealthy in your desire for the mind, right? The mind, the growth of the mind. He says, passage or uh, paragraph 17, this is the lesson of self-help. He says, we're so focused on ourself that often we forget that we have to see the power in helping others. And then he finishes paragraph 17 by saying it this way, can anything be so elegant as to have few wants and to serve them oneself so as to have somewhat left to give instead of being always prompt to grab. Now, we'll pause for a moment and remind ourselves that it was Aristotle who said um, to Plato about his notion of communism where no one has any personal or private property. It was the great Aristotle who pointed out, you can't be charitable with stuff you don't have. Emerson will make the same argument. You need stuff, but you need to be willing to part with that stuff, share that stuff. And therein is the key. He continues and finishes paragraph 17. It's more elegant to answer one's own needs than to be richly served. Inelegant, perhaps it may look today and to a few, but it's an elegance forever and to all. And then he continues with paragraph 18. Let's read it because he is aware that people may see that what he's saying is insane. I do not wish to be absurd or pedantic in reform. I do not wish to push, push my criticism on the state of things around me to that extravagant mark that shall compel me to suicide or to an absolute isolation from the advantages of civil society. Many said this was where Thoreau, his disciple, went too far. He moved to the woods for two years and lived alone. Of course, when we read Walden together, we'll point out how many times he spent time with other human beings. If we suddenly plant our foot and say, I will neither eat nor drink nor wear nor touch any food or fabric which I do not know to be innocent or deal with any person whose whole manner of life is not clear and rational, we shall stand still. Whose is so? Not mine, not thine, not his. But I think we must clear ourselves, each one by the interrogation, whether we have earned our bread today by the hearty contribution of our energies to the common benefit, and we must not cease to tend to the correction of these flagrant wrongs by laying one stone aright each day. Now this is huge, and I think we can't miss this, because if we do miss this, then we might see Emerson as being darkly skeptical about the possibility that anything he's saying could actually come to fruition. Here's what he's going to argue. We can't pull ourselves from the world. I will only wear garments that haven't been made by and then start making the list. I will only eat the food that I grow myself. We're familiar, of course, with movements that try as much as we can to grow our own food. That is to say, to live self-sustaining. But sooner or later, we got to live in a world where we share that world with other people who do not share our philosophic views, who do not share our goals, our ideals. And yet Emerson says... When you begin to grow dissatisfied with those around you, look first to yourself to try as much as you can to improve yourself. And then, of course, begin to try and live a little bit better with those around you in this world. Paragraph 19, he says, we have to revise all of our social structures, right? And he says it, all men are born to be reformers. He says it this way, what is a man born for but to be a reformer, a remaker of what man has made, a renouncer of lies, a restorer of truth and good, imitating that great nature which embosoms us all and which sleeps no moment on an old past, but every hour repairs himself, yielding us every morning a new day and with every pulsation a new life. Let him renounce everything which is not true to him. And put all his practices back on their first thoughts and do nothing for which he is not the whole world for his reason. If there be inconveniences in what is called ruin in the way, because we have so invariated and maimed ourselves, yet it would be like dying of perfumes to sink in the effort to reattach the deeds of every day to the holy and mysterious recesses of life. In other words, we can make our life and world better. But we have to begin with ourselves. Paragraph 19, um, he says it, the highest duty. And, um, and, and we'll, we'll begin to read here. It, is it not the highest duty that man should be honored in us? I ought not to allow any man, because he has broad lands, to feel that he is rich in my presence. 
I ought to make him feel that I can do without his riches, that I cannot be bought, neither my comfort, neither by pride, and though I be utterly penniless and receiving bread from him, that he is the poor man beside me. And if at the same time a woman or a child discovers a sentiment of piety or a juster way of thinking than mine, I ought to confess it by my respect and obedience, though it go to alter my whole way of life. Let's go ahead and make the point here that he says children should be teachers. The child is father of the man. You'll remember the Wordsworth poem from My Heart Leaps Up, right? And women, he says, very much in the world of men should be considered their equals in terms of teachers. This will sound very much like Plato's view that women, of course, like men, all possess a mind which is tripartite and therefore should be capable of being respected for their mind and their intellect, just like men. Well, by paragraph 20, when we're, when we're talking about this powerful self-pride, in other words, even if I receive, I have to receive help from you, charity from you, don't even begin to think that that charity that I accept from you makes you greater than me. In other words, self-pride. I may need charity. I may need help from you. But that doesn't mean that I'm lesser than you. A very democratic idea. Well, he begins now to bring this to an end in paragraph 21. And he says it. We lack, he says, faith and hope. Not only do we lack love, we lack faith and hope. Quote, he says... The Americans have no faith. They rely on the power of a dollar. They are deaf to sentiment. In other words, to go back to our earlier lecture, as Americans, Emerson says, we spend way too much time focused on that first box, the physical, and not enough time on the second box. In fact, he'll say it this way, I see it once. How paltry is all this generation of unbelievers? What a house of cards their institutions are, and I see what one brave man, what one great thought executed might effect. I see that the reason of the distrust of the practical man in all theory is his inability to perceive the means whereby we work. In other words, we work, but we rarely understand the importance of why we work. I would liken this to students who study, but don't see the real point in the study. They see it as kind of a waste of their time. I've got to do this so that I can get a grade, so that I can get a, uh, a graduation, so that I can go to college, so that I can get more degrees, so that I can get a job, so that I can make money. And at no point do we ever ask the question, yeah, but why? What's the point of all of this? Emerson is obviously challenging us to, to, uh, you know, to do that. At the conclusion of the 21st paragraph, he says it, but the believer not only beholds his heaven to be possible, but already to begin to exist, not by the men or materials the statements the state men uses, but by men transfigured and raised above themselves by the power principles. To principles, something else is possible that transcends all the powers of expediences. And I think this is the heart of why Emerson is so often misunderstood. Go back to that idea of the two boxes. Emerson is going to argue that principles are far more important than that stuff of the first box. You may be a beautiful person physically, but sooner or later, that will go away. But you can live a beautiful life, the second box and the quest of those concepts or ideals, and that will make your country great. That's his argument. Paragraph 22, he talks about the importance of enthusiasm. Everything great begins with enthusiasm. We're going to hear this again and again from Emerson. He is a great believer in the idea of enthusiasm, that capacity to believe that you can do something great in your life. And then he uses an amazing word picture. Here is Emerson talking to a bunch of Americans, and he says, let me give you an example of how enthusiasm works. Think about the spread of Islam. Really? You really are going to go there? He really does go there. And he says... Think about how a ragtag group of people get together. They have virtually nothing, and they will attack Jerusalem, and they will take Jerusalem. He says it. We have to appreciate just how amazing that is. But then notice in uh, paragraph 23, then, he will say, But there will be dawn ere long on our politics, on our modes of living, 
a nobler mourning than the Arabian faith and the sentiment of love. So in other words, as amazing as the Arabian accomplishment was, he says, there is one greater accomplishment coming, and it is the sentiment of love. This is the one remedy for all ills, the panacea of nature. We must be lovers, and at once the impossible becomes possible. Our age and history for these thousand years has not been the history of kindness, but of selfishness. Our distrust is very expensive. The money we spend for courts and prisons is very ill laid out. He goes on to even critique the notion that jails, we build jails instead of helping to educate young people so that they don't end up in jail. That is to say they have a legitimate reason to live an honest life. Well, he continues and he says it in paragraph 23. We have to appreciate all forms of work. We have to appreciate the janitor. We've said this before. We even call it Ruthie's Tree, Ruthie, our janitor in our school. To say that we appreciate the work that's being done. Don't ever make fun of somebody who makes your Big Mac because that individual is every bit as important as the person who, for example, owns the Big Mac. That's Emerson's view. Think about it this way. After you play your ball game and everybody's gone home, there's still got to be somebody that's cleaning up that place. You will graduate, walk the track, the balloons go up, the mascara runs, and an hour later, somebody's going to be putting away those chairs that you sat on. Can you respect those people? In other words, can you salute them in the streets, is the way that Emerson says it. All work is important. All Americans' work is important. And we immediately think of Whitman, and I hear America singing, and the list of all those different kinds of professions, and what are they? Well, they're hard workers, people who work with their hands, right? Uh, by the way, I've decided as well that even though Whitman's Leaves of Grass is not actually in the Harvard Classics, in the same way that I'm going to give lectures on Thoreau's Walden, I'll go ahead and give lectures as well on Whitman's Leaves of Grass, so we can look for that one coming in the future. Paragraph 23 will finish with him making an observation um, that the people, he says, do not wish to be represented or ruled by the ignorant and the base. They only vote for these because they were asked with the voice and semblance of kindness. Now this is an interesting idea, and it's already obviously taking us towards the debates that will happen in the late 20th century, early 21st century, about the demagogues who can speak and by speaking well can gain the public popular vote. Emerson was already kind of on to this. Um, is it true even today? He will continue by, um, by finishing paragraph 23 by saying it this way. But the people do not be, wish to be represented by the ignorant and the base. They will not vote for them long. They will inevitably prefer wit and probity, he will say it that way, right? And then finally he will finish paragraph uh, 23 by, by, saying it, um, by saying it this way. He says, um, the importance of armies, he said, will go away. And then he says it, love will creep where it cannot go, will accomplish that by imperceptible methods being its own lever, fulcrum, and power, which force could never achieve. Now, this is a, this is a compelling idea, and, um, and, and in the end, he says it, there is an, a simple idea, the power of kindness. And he says, think about mushrooms. No, this is a classic Arizonian idea, right? I mean, he loves nature. So he goes, think about mushrooms. You step on them, they just crush, right? Easy. And yet, how did they get above the ground? How did they break through the soil? Think about the power of that word picture. He will say it this way. A mushroom is the symbol of the power of kindness. The virtue of this principle in human society and application to great interests is obsolete and forgotten. Once or twice in history it's been tried in illustrious instances with single success. This great, overgrown, dead Christendom of ours still keeps alive at least the name of a lover of mankind. We'll remember this from the Divinity School Address. But one day all men will be lovers and every calamity will be dissolved in the universal sunshine. If you've ever heard the phrase, don't try and sell sunshine up my can, this actually is where it comes from. The notion that Emerson is going to say universal sunshine is in fact possible. 
he finishes this essay with the 24th paragraph. Will you suffer me to add one trait more to this portrait of man, the reformer? The, me the mediator between the spiritual and the actual world should have a great perspective prudence. Now by prudence here, we means, he means, uh, of course, wisdom. So write that down. Prudence here means balance. It means harmony. In other words, you can't go too far in any direction. And then he quotes an Arabian poet describing his hero by saying, quote, sunshine was his in the winter day and in the midsummer coolness and shade, end quote. He who would help himself and others should not be a subject of irregular and interrupted impulses of virtue, but a continent, persisting, immovable person, such as we have seen a few scattered up and down in time for the blessing of the world. Men who have in the gravity of their nature a quality which answers to the flywheel in a mill, which distributes the motion equitably over all the wheels and hinders it from falling unequally and suddenly in destructive shocks. It's better that joy should be spread over all the day in the form of strength than that it should be concentrated into ecstasies full of danger and followed by reactions. So let's just pause for a moment and point this out. Sustained will we talked about when we talked about the Stoics. Here we're talking about sustained joy. In other words, instead of getting all worked up about something and then for several days or maybe even weeks or possibly months adjusting your life, reforming yourself, Emerson says this is a lifelong calling. You have to do it forever. All your life, you have to be willing to live this way. There is a sublime prudence, which is the very highest that we know of man, which believing in a vast future sure of more to come than is yet seen, postpones always the present hour to the whole life, postpones talent to genius and special results to character. As the merchant gladly takes money from his income to add to his capital, so is the great man very willing to lose particular powers and talents so that he gain in the elevation of his life. Every athlete knows this. Dude, you're running up and down this floor in practice and you're about to puke. You could be home eating Doritos, playing video games. No, no. I have to train so that I can win. Every musician knows this. Would much rather be doing something other than practicing. Why are you practicing? Because I know if I don't practice, I don't perform well. In other words, this is the life of the true human. We are always trying to self-improve, be better. The opening of the, spiritual of the spiritual sense disposes men ever to greater sacrifices, to leave their signal talents, their best means and skill of procuring a present su success, their power and their fame, to cast all things behind in the insatiable thirst for divine communications. And I would write that phrase down, and that's where we get this notion of transcendentalism. To transcend the first box of the physical, to be more focused on the second box of the metaphysical, divine communications. It's the difference, again, between loving in physical terms. We've said this, the exchange of fluids is not love, that's sex. The notion that love is something far more profound, right? And to finish, he says it this way. A purer fame, a greater power, rewards the sacrifice. It's the conversion of our harvest into seed. As the farmer, watch this simile to finish, as the farmer casts into the ground the finest ears of his grain, the time will come when we top, uh, when we too shall hold nothing back, but shall eagerly convert more than we, than we now possess into means and powers, when we shall be willing to sow the sun and the moon for seeds. He says it then. The last word, seeds. The time shall come. Emerson the prophet. Emerson that hopeful prophet. Well, let's jump now quickly to level 2A, messages, themes. Well, what are we going to say about a text like this? Well, obviously, in terms of messages, themes, one is the challenge, right, of changing the world by changing yourself. Gandhi said it again, to be the change we wish to see in the world. Uh, secondly, of course, all work is sacred if it helps you see the second box and appreciate the second box, right? And then finally, think about that beautiful image of the mushroom and the power of kindness. Why is it that mushrooms are so often a part of our literature and our iconographic types of things? You know, you see pictures of mushrooms. What is up with that? 
For Emerson, it's the power that it pushes itself up gently through that soil and then becomes the beautiful mushroom. Level 2B, the rhetoric, well, we just mentioned it, right? The power of word pictures or metaphors, that mushroom. Think about the way he concedes a point. Emerson knows that he is, he's, he's walking a fine line. It reminds us of Wordsworth in that Tintern Abbey, if this be but a vain belief, yet oh, how often darkness amid the, choi, the many shapes of joyless daylight when the fretful stir and profitable. Um, in other words, I could be wrong, but I think I'm right. We'll call this Emerson's fallibilist position to speak in those epistemological terms we've talked about in earlier lectures. He's going to argue, I could be wrong about my view about kindness, for example, or love, or faith, or hope, but I think I'm right, and I think that you can live a better life if you give your energies to that. Of course, that is the optimism of his prose, right? You want to believe it is possible, even though maybe you're kind of skeptical about it, like, yeah, I don't know about this whole thing of universal sunshine, but we would like to believe that, right? Or as we have said in our Plato lecture, which kind of home do you want to live in? Which kind of family do you want to live in? One where people treat each other well, or one where everybody's nasty? Well, I lived in a family where everybody was nasty. Well, then in your family, create something different. That's his point. That's his point. No longer ask, why is this happening to me? But rather learn to ask, why is this happening for me? As we said in a prior lecture. At level 3A, how do we relate this to other texts into the world? Well, of course, Thoreau immediately comes to mind, right? His comment, a man is rich in proportion to the things he can live without. We think of Plato's influence, don't we, right? And, of course, Aristotle's notion about the importance of the middle class and the idea, of course, of Marx and his communism, all of those I would hope that you would be able to study on your own. Finally, think about Emerson's beautiful ability to quote and cite from non-Western European sources, non-European, non-Western sources. He loves to quote Arabic proverbs. We've got an Egyptian proverb that's quoted. His celebration, for example, of the rise of Islam. Um, this